the initial FEMA report uh, basically acknowledged that the kerosene would have burned off very quickly. What wasn't destroyed in the initial fireball would have been consumed fairly rapidly and would have only really served as an ignition for the rest of the material. And the second point being that the, the fuel here really was strictly office contents. If you think of a modern office with copying machines, computers, uh, and as has been previously mentioned, the, the smoke, particularly from building two just before it collapsed, was, was very black looking. Uh, this is generally an indication of an inefficient fire in which there is not enough oxygen for the amount of fuel. These types of fires typically burn very cool. They, they are not hot flames like blowtorches. Uh, the cores themselves, basically, uh, if you've seen diagrams of the building, there's a large central rectangle in each of the towers that contained 47 columns. And these columns basically were the, the, the primary structural support of the building. They were given the role of supporting the, the whole gravitational load of the building. Uh, since they were so strong, it would have been reasonable to think that they would have withstood, at least to some extent, the collapse. But in fact, as we see after the buildings collapsed, there was basically only little stubs of these things standing up a floor or two above the ground level. The cores did not have much in them that would burn. The cores basically were dedicated to things like elevator shafts, utility shafts, stairways. Uh, so you have drywall material, you have a little bit of carpeting, you don't really have any inflammable material in the core itself. The core was specifically designed so it could not function as a chimney. They did not want in the case of a fire, for the fire to be able to travel through the elevators or for air to come in through the elevators. So they were designed with what this uh, architect, Aaron Swirsky, I believe it was, referred to as a hermetically sealed system. There were fire shutters that were designed to close off the core in the event of, of an event like this. And those, as far as we know, functioned properly, which means that there was a very limited amount of oxygen available. Okay, as far as the issue of what failed and how, uh, some of the initial suggestions, and these showed up in the NOVA documentary, which is a good example of what I like to call proof by a computer animation. Uh, Thomas Egar, who was a material scientist but not a structural engineer who became a, a spokesman for these documentaries, uh, indicated that the floors had somehow failed, that the trusses supporting the floors had failed. Uh, this was the, the theory that was put forward actually in the initial FEMA report. Uh, subsequently, there have been basically complete contradictions of that. Uh, Jim Hoffman has done quite a bit of research which is available on the web concerning the, the problems with this idea that the floors would have simply fallen. There was a study done by Weidlinger Associates. The chief engineer there was Mathis Levy, who's a very well-known authority on building collapses. He specifically disavowed the idea of pancaking or collapsing of the floors. And the most recent official report we have on this, which is from National Institutes of Standards and Technology, NIST, rejected the idea that floor collapse was part of it. Uh, and so as, as a result, we have basically no sequential model at this point. What NIST has suggested is that there was some kind of simultaneous collapse of the cores, but they have not attempted to uh, give any kind of, of uh, modeling as to whether those cores could have, in fact, been destroyed by the fires in the way that they claim. Unfortunately, the material that would have allowed a detailed fire analysis, the actual physical evidence, is all gone. Uh, one of the most significant things to, to my thinking uh, uh, that indicates that this could not have been the sort of collapse that we are told it was is the presence of the dust clouds. Uh, and as you've seen in the pictures, and I'm sure all of us have, have uh, seen probably more than we would like, uh, there were very, very large clouds of very thick dust that enveloped the area that crossed the river that uh, made it almost all the way to New Jersey from the pictures that I've seen. Uh, this type of flow is something that we are familiar with in physics. It occurs in only two situations that we know of naturally. Uh, one is in volcanic eruptions where a large amount of material is suddenly exploded into the air and basically forms small particles. Uh, the other situation is something called turbidity currents. These occur along the edges of the continental shelves where 
mud or sediment will slump, become suspended in water. And the, the common thread is that you have large amounts of a, a dense material that is suspended very quickly in a fluid, thereby creating another denser fluid, which is in effect the dust cloud. And that fluid can achieve considerable velocities. Uh, the problem with creating this sort of uh, slurry of fine particles is that there really is no mechanism that has been proposed. We have concrete floors with carpeting or flooring over them. We have furniture. We have floors basically that are coming together in a collapse, but the concrete is basically protected under these layers. Uh, early in the collapse, in the very first moments, we see these thick clouds being ejected at very high speed. They're clearly dense because they flow downward and become part of this large overall pyroclastic flow. Uh, what we're basically being told is that the concrete sort of jumped up into midair, exploded itself, and then was ejected as the floors came together. Not a very plausible mechanism, but I, I have yet to hear of, of anything else proposed to explain it. Uh, from quite a few people on the scene, we've been told that the powder uh, it represented most of the concrete, that the amount of intact macroscopic chunks of concrete on the scene were, were negligible, that basically everything was reduced to powder. And incidentally, we also know that other things besides concrete were reduced to powder. We know that contents of computers, exotic metals from computer chips, these sorts of things were, were also identified in the dust and in very small particles, uh, generally on the order of less than 100 microns in diameter. So we have a real issue of mechanism as far as what in the, in the process of this collapse could cause so many things to be pulverized so finely. For the, the towers to collapse the way we saw them collapse basically implies that the columns simply collapsed into themselves. They telescoped straight down. Uh, steel keeps a lot of its structural integrity, uh, even, even when heated, until you begin to approach the melting point, you, you don't really see a catastrophic loss of strength. And this is what we're talking about. We're talking about basically vertical box columns collapsing into themselves, which implies a complete loss of mechanical strength. And as far as the initial impacts, this recent uh, NIST study made an interesting point about World Trade Centers uh, 2. Uh, the film analysis showed that, that it oscillated for about four minutes after it was struck by the airplane. And the oscillation rate was identical to what would be expected for the intact tower. Trade Center towers and most modern buildings are heavily redundant in the sense that the load bearing can be shifted to other members if some of them fail. And we, we saw that happen in this case. Stresses do redistribute. But absent further weakening of the structural members, that distribution is, is limited. It, it happens, the, the structure restabilizes, and unless there's significant further damage, it doesn't progress to a total collapse. World Trade One began collapsing from the very top after an hour and 40 minutes. Uh, it's very hard to imagine office contents progressively heating up high, hotter and hotter over that period of time. And for a building to collapse from the very top, which is the least heavily loaded, is also very uh, odd, to say the least. Uh, just a couple of other anomalies. As we know, there were reports of explosions. There were reports of underground explosions in both of the towers at the time of the impact from a building engineer by the name of Philip Morelli. There are interviews with him on the web. Uh, from the Noday Brothers film, 9-11, we see that the lobby of the North Tower was extensively damaged with what looks like high explosive blast damage. And this was immediately after the plane collision. But uh, we know that on the weekend before, there were power downs. And there appear to have been evacuation drills going on throughout the, the previous week, uh, which suggests that uh, at least some people knew that, uh, that something was happening. The power downs may represent a time window in which demolition charges would have been planted, although I, I think it's possible that uh, they also were, were planted over a much longer period of time, uh, given the relative accessibility of the buildings. OK, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff King. Thank you very, very much. As far as 9-11 is concerned,
What is most important for you to understand is the concept of a law of nature. A law of nature cannot be violated. A law of nature cannot be changed. A law of nature requires no enforcement. The key issues to consider are going to be the, the, the rate at which these buildings fell, the temperature at which steel melts, the order in which the buildings fell, and uh, the force that would have been required to turn concrete into a fine powder. Those are some of the key issues that I'm going to address. These two buildings were some of the most remarkable structures uh, in, in engineering history. They were two 110-story buildings. They were extremely well constructed, and they were designed, as I will explain, to withstand the impact of aircraft collisions, even multiple aircraft collisions. Many very cool. They, they are not hot flames like blowtorches. Uh, the cores themselves, basically, uh, if you've seen diagrams of the building, there's a large central rectangle in each of the towers that contained 47 columns. And these columns basically were the, the, the prime of a modern office with copying machines, computers. Uh, and as has been previously mentioned, the, the smoke, particularly from building two just before it collapsed, was, was very black looking. Uh, this is generally an indication of an inefficient fire in which there's not enough oxygen for the amount of fuel. These types of fires typically burn level. The cores did not have much in them that would burn. The cores basically were dedicated to things like elevator shafts, utility shafts, stairways. Uh, so you have drywall material, you have a little bit of carpeting, you don't really have any inflammable material in the core itself. The core was specifically designed so it could not function as a chimney. They did not want primary structural support of the building. They were given the role of supporting the, the whole gravitational load of the building. Uh, since they were so strong, it would have been reasonable to think that they would have withstood, at least to some extent, the collapse. But in fact, as we see after the buildings collapsed, there was basically only little stubs of these things standing up a floor or two above the ground. The initial FEMA report uh, basically acknowledged that the kerosene would have burned off very quickly. What wasn't destroyed in the initial fireball would have been consumed fairly rapidly and would have only really served as an ignition for the rest of the material. And the second point being that the, the fuel here really was strictly office contents. If you think 